Dalton Reisner's practice window is now open. The Vikings get O-line help, but what does that mean for Ed Ingram? Welcome to the Lockdown Vikings podcast. You are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, where we're always trying to learn something new. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thank you so much for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day every single day. I appreciate my hashtag everydayers so very much. I love you all to death. If you are new here, hello and welcome. You can find Locked On Vikings wherever you find your favorite podcast. Just search it out on whatever app you use. You can also find the show on YouTube or Amazon Fire and Roku if you download the Locked On Minnesota Sports app. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off of your first purchase. Today is Twitter Tuesday. That means I'm answering your questions as submitted to me via the Google form, which you can find in the show notes, or just by sending me an email. You can send me an email at any time at lockedonvikingspodcast at gmail.com or via Twitter, of course. And uh, a bunch of the questions that I got today were about Dalton Reisner, whose 21-day practice window has opened Um, It sounds like he's on a much different timeline than TJ Hawkinson, who's currently in the middle of his 21-day window. That's the way it works when you go on IR, on uh, designated to return. When you're getting close, you open this 21-day practice window so you can have a little bit of a ramp-up time before you actually add them to the active roster. so They can practice a little bit, get their feet under them without eating up a roster spot for that time. So the Vikings seem optimistic but not sure uh, about TJ Hawkinson's to Hawkinson's chances of of being ready to roll and done with all of the processes he has to be done with by the Lions game, but it kind of sounds like if not the Lions game, it he'll if he's missing it, he's missing it by like a day or two, and he'll be ready to go by Thursday night football against the Rams. Um, so we'll keep an eye out on that. But now Reisner's has just opened, so he has 21 days from Monday, October 14th, to get all set to go. Uh, with his back injury, which I don't even think we knew that it was a back injury until that was reported as part of this. Uh, maybe we did, but that, that was news to me. Um, so now, when asked about this, uh, Andrew Kramer reported, you know, he asked about this with, with Reisner, and Reisner said, you know, oh, I've been healthy for a while, I'm ready to go. So he doesn't anticipate it being very long. He might not use all 21 days of the 21-day window. By the way, if you get to the end of the 21-day window and then you still aren't activated, you go, you revert back to IR and then it's season ending. Um, that I think it only really applies in the case of like a setback. But I think, you know, he says he's in football playing shape. So, you know, the conditioning is all there and stuff. Although I do think that like practicing in a way that you're not allowed to win on IR, but you are allowed to in the window is like part of it. So I think that's probably what we're waiting on for Reisner is that, you know, he's got to get into pads and get hit and get kind of back acclimated to all that stuff. Um, So whenever that happens, the question then becomes, what is Reisner's role on the Minnesota Vikings? Um, So a whole bunch of people asked some version of that question. Rob Meek even asked, are you tired of the Ingram Reisner questions? I think now is probably the best time to ask it. Uh, I think it was a very weird thing to ask week two when he was on IR. It's like, when he, they're not going to bench him for a guy that's like not healthy right now. But if he's healthy and he's ready to go and, and you know, asking for the backup to go in is, is a fairly normal thing. And now that he is kind of reentering the conversation, okay, let's parse this out. So JT MN Skoll asks, last year, Ingram's performance began to improve after the signing of Reisner. Could, be, could that be coincidence or, or could it be due to the idea that Ingram felt threatened by the signing? Um, so Reisner got signed week two last year. He was in the building the whole time. So I don't know if that's necessarily it, or, or maybe that, um, Ingram's season got better as it went on is maybe people being, maybe it was perceived that like the pressure mounted with each and every week and suddenly it got better. But I think he just was a second year player improving as things went on. Um, but I like the way that Chez put it. He asked, uh, curious about the disconnect between the more fan centered podcast slash community and the more football slash quote unquote informed analysts on Ed Ingram. 
the question is, is this as simple as him and Bradbury being so good in the run game that it helps make up for the deficiencies in pass protection? So this actually came up in, in the Minnesota football party as well. I do think that run blocking has just become an underrated thing. I, I think because of the way that the narrative has evolved around the run game in the last five-ish, ten-ish even years about how running the ball is stupid and bad and it doesn't matter and running backs don't matter and the running game doesn't matter and you don't need to establish it and you don't need to... And like, it, the world has become very anti-run. You ju it just think that it, running the ball unless it's third and short is a bad idea and that you shouldn't do it and that nobody cares if their run game is good anymore. Um, I think that is way overcorrected for that. I think that the the people that started that, like a lot of people in like the analytics community started that, had a good point and I think it's just been way, way overblown. Um... And you have to understand that you might not care about run blocking, but NFL teams care about run blocking. They, they care a lot about run blocking and establishing the run and all of that. And maybe you don't think they should, but you kind of have to understand that they do and that that's the perspective that they're coming at this from. And Ed Ingram's run blocking has been phenomenal. I do not care what the, the two-digit number on the website says. His run blocking has been absolutely fantastic. Honestly, outside of Darasaw, I think he's maybe my favorite run blocker on the team. But here is, I, I think, the real disconnect. If you're looking for what's the disconnect between people who see Ed Ingram's performance and want him benched, and then people who see who 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 don't look at like the stats and say, yeah, this guy's doing fine, or they don't even really mention him at all. And I think the reason is because pass protection is very contextual. And part of the problem that I have with some of the websites like PFF and, and NextGen that, that try to track it is they try to pull it out of context in, in, in the interest of like isolating players. But I think it's too contextual for that to be a good idea. Um, if you have one guard that's bad at pass protection or say you have a guard in a center that are struggling at pass protection, right? Um, you can try to engineer ways for those two to be in double teams with each other and get away with it a lot. They'll eventually they'll find a way to isolate those guys here and there, but you can do a lot to hide those guys by just sliding. I'm not even talking about chipping or keeping running backs in or like spending resources. I'm just talking about the protections that you call are sort of designed to isolate certain players and then leave other players with a lot of help. And you can sort of point that at whatever the talent you think you have is. Um, so you can, you can paper that over quite a bit. If you have a guard that is struggling in pass protection, let me put it this way. Your paces that you run through to fix that problem do not start and end with bench the guy and put in a new guy. That's the nuclear option. That is the, oh my God, we're giving this guy help. He's screwing up his levels. He, he isn't stepping the right way. He's laid out of his stances and he's doing all of these bad mistakes regularly. Not just, ah, oh, he got his arm defeated there and the guy got a win on him. Like you kind of need to be making like, active mistakes that hang your teammates out to dry as well as you, I think to be like benchably bad. If you want to see a bunch of examples of that, watch the New England Patriots. Their offensive line famously a disaster and there's a lot of that going on. Now, I don't know if they've got a better guy to turn to. So different problem. That's for locked on Patriots. But um, I guess all, what I'm saying is it's not that bad of a problem. And it that's not to say that it isn't poor performance, but it's not an unsolvable problem that that you you simply must fire the guy and wag your finger at him and tell him to go, to go sit on the bench. Um, you can slide protections his way. You can change the quarterback drops. This is a huge one. The Vikings have used a lot of seven step drops, a lot of longer developing plays. They're going you know, kill shot, kill shot, kill shot, right? Like a ton of um, attempts at, at explosives. Will those take forever? to develop and you've got a block for that and I don't think the Vikings would be calling all of those if they didn't feel pretty good about their offensive line's ability to block for that and so we've given up a lot of pressures but how many of them come late in the down which is why you actually see really big divergences in numbers when you look at PFF versus say next gen stats that goes on a 2.5 second model and PFF is a lot more about like space about like quarterbacks moving off their spot or whatever and so you can see that there's this kind of difference. And so you ask, like, so is this really a problem? Or are they asking the O-line to do something really, really hard that they're doing okay at, and it's unlocking this crazy big offense? If you've got a huge problem with the guard, you can chill out on the shot plays. 
Like that's the first pace. And if you still have a problem, you can start sliding protections over him more often. And if you still have a problem, then maybe you can get tight ends or running backs more involved in pass protection. If you still have a problem, then maybe we talk about benching somebody. But I don't think so. I don't think the Vikings are as high on Dalton Reisner as a lot of you guys are. Uh, and I think that that's just kind of the reality of the situation. But I've got a whole bunch more questions. They're not all about Ed Ingram. So uh, let's make sure that we have enough time to dive into all of those. That'll all be next. Today's episode of Locked On Vikings is brought to you by FanDuel. It's America's number one sports book. It's the best place to go get your gramble on. Guess what? The Vikings are favored now. They're one and a half point favorites at home against the Lions. If you took the line, uh, you could have gotten the Vikings plus three if you took it before the week was played. And maybe Aiden Hutchinson getting hurt has a lot to do with that. Uh, but the Viking, or maybe it's just one of those things where not a lot of people were hitting the line until it was the next game. So then it kind of all normalized out. But that's the kind of thing that happens at FanDuel. And it's worth checking back to see if lines have like changed to see if you can maybe even get better deals. Uh, or maybe you just want to wait till after the injury reports are all out so you know exactly what you're looking at. But whatever it is, you can get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet at FanDuel.com. So sign up at FanDuel.com or download the app and you can place one $5 bet on anything. Whether that bet wins or loses, you get $200 back in bonus bets. Nice little chunk of money to get you started so you can play around and find what is fun for you. That is at FanDuel.com, America's number one sports book. Today's episode is also brought to you by Prize Picks, which is daily fantasy. It's the best way to play daily fantasy. Prize Picks allows you to get up to to a hundred times your money if you hit on everything in your lineup. Just pick two to six of your favorite players, and whether you think they'll do better or worse than their Prize Picks projection in any number of metrics, yards, fantasy points, like classic, if you want to do it that way, or you can also do touchdowns or passing attempts or any kind of other thing. Uh, you can find all of that at Prize Picks, of course. And if you check back regularly, you will also find promos. For example, like in this last Monday Night Football thing, you can do combos at Prize Picks where there was one I had that was Dalton Kincaid and Garrett Wilson getting more than 100 and a half receiving yards. But at a certain moment on Monday afternoon, it was 90 and a half receiving yards and I clicked the more than on that they ended up getting way over 100 anyways but that's the kind of thing that you can get if you're really a hawk about it so go check it out at prizepicks.com you can download the app today and if you use code locked on NFL you can get $50 instantly after you play your first $5 lineup that's $50 instantly after you play a $5 lineup for the first time at prize picks just with code locked on NFL prize picks run your game Moving on with this Twitter Tuesday episode of the Locked On Vikings podcast. Hopefully I answered whatever version of a Dalton Reisner Ed Ingram question that you had. Um, I don't think that the Vikings are going to like immediately start looking to replace Dalton Reisner. I think if they continue to have a problem with Ed Ingram, if, if, they, if they even view it as a problem, they will go through other paces first. They'll stop asking the world of him and the rest of the line if they feel like it can't hold up. They'll go to... Um, you know, other protection resources. They'll go to a lot of things before they start changing the chemistry of the O-line because they want to preserve what is truly special going on up front in the run game. I really do believe that. I really do believe that this is the best run blocking we've seen in Minnesota in a long, 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 long time. Like, go back to Jerome Felton. Um, next one is JG, who says, who asks, if they were being truthful, how much do the Vikings manage, do the Vikings management regret the Ezra Cleveland trade? If they were being truthful, okay, so if I were to try to read between the lines of how they feel about that, I don't think that they would think about it a lot. Ezra Cleveland was on the last year of his deal. Now, personally, I think that the Vikings made themselves worse in the end of 2023. And who knows, maybe a little bit better guard play. Like, I think Reisner was worse than Ezra Cleveland. And now Cleveland's playing a little better in Jacksonville. So much is going wrong in Jacksonville, though, that, like, that I don't like if Cleveland does have a bad game, it's like, uh, what else is wrong? Like it's whatever. Um, but I do think that they made themselves worse in 2023. They got one sixth round pick. Uh, I think they spent it on Walter Rouse. So they turned Ezra Cleveland into Walter Rouse, basically like that doesn't feel that great. And they could have extended him, but then also feel really good about Blake Brandle. So if you ask Kwesi, he probably would say, well, Hey, we made a value judgment. 
We have Blake Brandle at the price we have now. Maybe you could accuse him of cheaping out, and he would say, yes, we did, but then we you know, we, we had money to spend on this and this and that, and this is, we couldn't have gotten Stefan Gilmore if we hadn't. Or like They could make arguments like that all day long. Uh, but I don't know if they would like be like, oh, we regret it so much. God, we got rid of Ezra Cleveland. I think they're pretty happy with Blake Brandle, to be honest with you. Uh, they probably would prefer their O-line situation a lot if Dalton Reisner were healthy all year, but that point is very quickly becoming moot. Ryan Higgins asks, if Brain Flores, <laughs> sorry, I had to do it too, uh, gets a head coaching job, would you rather want someone from within to try to continue the Flores scheme or an outside hire and change schemes again? Oh, man, this is hard. So ideal world, I would love to stick with the scheme as it is being run post Flores, which eventually he will leave, right? Like, I think that is known. And the Vikings kind of got to be the playground where he invented this cool thing, and now they're reaping the benefits. So good for them. Um, but eventually he's going to leave the, the lawsuit thing will go over some, it'll blow over. Somebody will eventually take the chance and they'll leave him. Right. Um, if you trust somebody to run it aggressively enough, this is the concern that I have. If you bring somebody in to just run the Flores scheme, if another defensive coordinator decides I'm going to run the Flores scheme, but I'm not as crazy as Flores. Maybe I won't blitz as much. The whole thing falls apart. The whole thing is designed to blitz at volume, to, to blitz not in a we're going to pick our spots kind of way, but to blitz often, to blitz half of a game, to be able to blitz 80% of a game if you think that's what's going to mess up that quarterback and like have a sustainable defense while blitzing. So if you do all that, but you don't blitz, you basically just have like a vanilla zone defense and every quarterback in the NFL can pick that apart with their eyes closed. So you have to be willing to, to blitz at volume. If you can guarantee me that, absolutely. I think the guy would probably be Durante Jones. He's the pass game coordinator and he's a secondary coach. Uh, he's D-backs. So he's, I think, the next highest ranking guy on the defensive staff. Uh, unless you wanted to give the job to like Mike Pettin or something like that and then have him run the scheme. But I don't know if that works because I, I, I don't think Mike Pettin has that dog in him. Uh, maybe Durante Jones would, it would be maybe somebody like from inside. I certainly wouldn't try to go run this scheme with somebody from the outside. I think that would be a very weird way to do it. But if you are, if you don't trust that, if you, you know, you interview those two guys and they both are like, yeah, but we probably won't blitz as much. And you go, okay, then I don't think this is going to work. Then sure. Just go get somebody and just like pretend you fired your guy. Right. And just, just act that way. Act like you, okay, we just got to do something new and we have to build this now and so long. And thanks for all the fish. I don't think that's the way they do that. I think they're going to try to preserve this really cool magic they got going on here, assuming it sustains throughout the rest of the year uh, and beyond for however long Flores is here. I would love for it to be Durante Jones. I wouldn't be surprised if if they gave that job to Petten, but it would be a very different pet Mike Petten than the one that like the Packers had because he wouldn't be running like Fangio stuff anymore. Uh, it, but I would just I would just really want to make sure that this guy's is this guy's psycho enough. You got to be crazy enough to run the Flores thing. You, know, you can't with no normal people, no normies allowed. Uh, famous Norseman asks so far, our game script has been to force turnovers and get an early lead, force the opponent to abandon the run to catch up and kill their QB with manic Flores looks. How will this defense hold up if the opponent is not playing from behind and incorporating an actual run game? So the run defense has been fantastic and it's been part of building those leads that teams have been in second and 10, third and nine. And then that force that, that has caused quarterbacks to force balls into weirdly tight windows. Like they've gotten a lot of these turnovers on third down where if the DB dropped it, they'd be punting anyways. So like the actual EPA impact there is, is maybe more mitigated than you think. Um, but that had those situations have been brought about by really efficient run defense and it's down to down efficient run defense. Uh, they've, they've been able to stop a lot of these up for one and two yards, really great, great highlight reel of TFLs. So I do think that it, it, it currently has all the traits it needs to pass that test, but also that probably assumes we're going up against a better team. This is kind of a lion's question. The lions have a really good run game. Uh, and, if they take care of the ball, then yeah, the Vikings are going to have to get off the field on third downs and stuff, but assuming they can force a lot of third and longs by having a really good run defense, like it, that's going to be a really interesting matchup of this Lions game is their run game versus the Vikings run defense and how good it's been. 
Bad Dad Joke asks, with the skill set Dallas Turner has, what does an expanded role for him look like in the Flores defense? Uh, Andrew Van Ginkel. It, it's very clear the way that he, the, the role that Dallas Turner plays when he rotates in, I think he rotates in very often when Van Ginkel rotates out, if just going off the dome on that. But also, he plays a very similar role where he will line up off the ball. Grenard won't do that. They won't do that with Patrick Jones. Like They aren't doing that with, with Jihad Ward or any of those other guys. It's just Van Ginkel and Turner that are actually lining up off the ball. And they're doing a lot of the same stuff. Van Ginkel's on a two-year deal, and then I'm going to guess they let him walk, and Dallas Turner is the new Gink. Next up, I have a bunch of uh, Lions questions. You guys want to ask questions about the Lions game? We'll have a lot of time to talk about the Lions game later in the week, uh, but you do have some questions, so I will answer those as well as some other miscellaneous stuff. All that's coming up. Today's episode of Locked on Vikings is brought to you by Game Time, the best place to get last minute tickets to anything. If you're trying to get to a Vikings game, especially if you didn't maybe plan to get to a Vikings game in April when you needed to, when the tickets, you know, first over May, whenever they first open uh, and, you know, the schedule first comes out, but you're going, wow, they're way better than I thought. Maybe I want to get out to a game. Maybe you want to go find a way to the upcoming Lions game or maybe the game that's coming down the pipe, uh, I think, end of November when Kirk Cousins comes to town or maybe uh, around New Year's when they're going to play the Packers. Any of those you can find those tickets on game time. You can find them even if spontaneous going, man, hey, you had plans this Sunday. They canceled. You want to check out a Vikings game? Go check out game time. Last minute tickets is what they do best. Even if you don't even know what you're going to do, you can actually let them curate your weekend for you. Find a very good deal. And if you're open minded enough, they'll take you to a concert or a comedy show or whatever it is they can find a deal on. You can get the craziest savings through that curation. Let spontaneity take you. With Game Time, download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off of your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N N F L for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. Keeping it rolling here with the Locked On Vikings podcast. The next one comes from Magic Skull Bus. Bunch of Lions questions now. Uh, he asks, "Does Hutchinson going down change the outcome significantly for you? It changes the game plan a lot." Here's the question that I have right now headed into the week. I want to make a Patreon video about this, patreon.com slash LukeBronNFL, whenever that comes out. But my question is, what do the Lions do now? And the and I, I'm not just talking about what are they who, who are they going to trade for Hassan Redick or whatever, because their entire pass structure was designed around getting Hutchinson one-on-ones. I don't know if there is a guy they can get their hands on, especially with Hassan Reddick now actively in negotiations and trying to get something done with the with the Jets. Maybe he was the only guy, but he's a totally different kind of player. I don't know if there is a player out there that they can just bring right in and put in that role. And I don't know if there's a guy in the building. They have to redesign their entire philosophy of pass rushing. It can't just be Aiden Hutchinson and the Pussycat Dolls anymore. It has to be a more of a team effort. And there are plenty of pass rush ways to handle that when you don't have uh, the guy, <laughs> you know, when you have uh, uh, more of an ensemble. Um, there are ways to do that and there are ways to be very successful doing that. What they will do, I'm very curious about. But first, I, I, I need to kind of look at what they did after Aiden Hutchinson went down, maybe what they've done in past years without Hutchinson because he, I think he missed a couple games last year how they've handled that, but it's totally different to game plan for. So what we're going into is the Vikings not really knowing what kind of pass rush plan they're going to see. The Lions not knowing if the pass rush plan that they're about to go in is going to work. They have no proof of concept of it because this whole year they've had Hutchinson and it's going to come down to who makes the right adjustments. The first couple drives, there's going to be a result and it's probably going to be an extreme one. Uh, and then after that, who needs to adjust and do their adjustments work and do the responding adjustments work is going to be that, that like a very important part of this matchup. How does one team make it work? And the Vikings who can't predict what the Lions are going to do, how do they adapt to it in real time when they finally do see cards on the table? Uh, Joe Talent asks, if I were Detroit playing the Vikings defense, I think I'd run the entire first half, if not the entire game. Why risk interceptions and confusion when you can party in a phone booth and get the defense tired. I love where your heart's at. Uh, in spirit, I, I get it for sure. 
I don't know if the Vikings have been the team you'll want to do that against. I think if you want to find success against the Vikings defense, you probably want to try to isolate one-on-one matchups and throw on the corners. Um, you know, try to get them out of comfortable situations. I don't know if challenging Ivan Pace to make plays is a winning strategy because he's been able to do that really well. Uh, but generally, you still need to find some kind of balance because the run and the pass, when both of them are a threat, they play off of each other, they help each other. There is a symbiotic relationship there. And to just like super uber commit to one over the other is just, it, you don't want to be one, like defenses want to make you one dimensional. Don't do it for them. Uh, Jack from St. Paul asks, in my mind, the only way to slow down the Lions offense is to stop the run and get Goff passing and to get pressure on him. How do you like our chances against their elite run game? I, I talked about this a little bit with the um, with the the other question, but it's going to be a tough one. They have some very good players up front uh, that also play a lot of gap. Vikings have been really good against zone runs. A lot of the run schemes they've seen so far have been guys trying to reach block them, and the Vikings have essentially been slashing with that action, defeating those reach blocks, denying those reach blocks, beating the lineman to the spot he's trying to race you to, and then um, you know creating havoc from there. It's a really easy way to get penetration and stuff. Playing against gap is a different game. Um, so again, it'll be this, and this is, I think the challenge the lions present to a lot of teams, because there aren't a lot of like gap focused teams nowadays. It's a lot of zone. So they are kind of, uh, okay, let's see how our, our gap stuff works. Let's see how we do with this. We know that works. Let's see how we do with this will be difficult. And again, you know, the first couple drives to set that tone will be important. If the, if it's just working, the run game is just working and they're just getting, you know, slashing you for eight a pop then the Vikings might need to make some more drastic adjustments, putting extra guys in the box, um, you know, maybe changing what kind of personnel plans they have. Um, That is a cost. That's something that they're going to be like resistant to doing. But hey, if you're getting slashed for nine a pop, you got to do what you got to do. But if, you know, you're stopping up everything, then it's the Lions that maybe will have to make adjustments and trying to pass more and then then they get into that world, which is exactly what you want them to get in. Nolan M asks, why does it seem like every time we get a chunk play, it's Jefferson over the middle running a basic? Okay, this is a great question, and I'm so glad you asked it. So this is so key to McVeigh passing games. This is drives at a concept that is insanely foundational to like one third of NFL teams offenses. And that is that split field coverages are all the rage right now. There's a lot of cover three in the league still, still, but all of these big schemes have their different ways of splitting the field in half and covering one side this way and the other side that way, whether it's Fangio doing their cover six, cover cover eight thing, that's the old, the old Donatel way that a lot of teams still employ, uh, or the more Flores-y, Belichick-y, Saban-y, this is also a Zimmer thing way, which is basically playing quarters or playing a lot of cover two in Tampa two. Um, there are a lot of co- coverage structures that like to split the field in half, and to attack that, Teams like the Vikings and Rams and 49ers and Bears and Packers and all these other teams, uh, Bengals, all of those teams like to send players from one side of the field to the other across, right? If you have a coverage structure, let's say you see two passing threats on one side of the field and three on the other, right? Maybe two receivers on either side and then the running back is on a side. You will have a coverage structure meant to handle three receiving threats on that side and a coverage structure meant to handle two receiving threats on the other side. So if you take one of those guys and you run them across the field and suddenly your three side has two guys on it and your two side has three guys on it, your whole thing is messed up. And every defense has ways of communicating and ways on the whiteboard of dealing with these kinds of ideas, but it's really difficult to execute. So those basics across the middle or deep overs will get there a lot too are designed to force the defenses into difficult communication spots and over the course of a game, they're just going to mess up a few of them. Everybody does. Nobody's, nobody's nerfed, okay? And and you can kind of take advantage of that and just keep attacking them in that way and, and wait for them to make a mistake. MN Sports Appreciator asks, when, if ever, can J.J. McCarthy be on the sideline? He's been part of team meetings and et cetera, right? But to my knowledge, yeah, he's been involved in those. Um, I think the barrier with him on the sideline is just standing up for that long. And at what point does it not become a concern to make him do that? And I think the 
goal, if I recall, I'm again, I'm going off the dome. I, I think I saw somebody say it was like November uh, that maybe he can do that. But right now, the barrier is a physical one. Can he do He's allowed to do whatever he wants, but can he physically do that uh, without it being like fatiguing in a way that would potentially uh, influence his rehab? So you don't want to do that, of course, right? Um, but yeah, he's been a part of team meetings. He's been involved in all of it, but I think he's not on the sideline right now because I think he just right now he's still very braced up and everything is still very fragile and delicate. And you don't want him standing there on the sideline for, during all that, especially you don't want somebody, you know, to, to roll into him while he's standing there or something like that. Like what happened to that ball boy in the, uh, the Giants game, uh, left on Landon asks, add any player in Vikings player in their prime to this defense that is not in the hall of fame or ring of honor. Who is it? Antoine Winfield. No, he's not in the ring of honor. That feels like an excellent one that you can add and, and putting that in the Flores world. But but you'd put him at outside corner uh, and he would immediately take over for like a Gilmore or a Shaq Griffin and just become this like super wrecking ball over there, especially with all the perimeter screens that they see. Oh my God, he would feast. Uh, but if you don't like that one, if you're happier with the corners, Pat Williams next to uh, Harrison Phillips feels like quite the bomb. <laughs> that feels pretty cool. Unfortunately, a lot of your favorites are made ineligible by this. A lot of your favorites from like the 80s and the 70s. I mean, they're all in the Ring of Honor or, or, or some version of something. So uh, I'll go with Pat Williams or Antoine Winfield. Pick your choose. Uh, Red and Purple asks, this will be the last one. Your most unhinged question. Does Sam Darnold get into the Ring of Honor when he wins the Super Bowl? <laughs> uh, on a slightly more serious note, what qualifies you for the Ring of Honor? Okay, so... If the Vikings win a Super Bowl with this kind of build or whatever they whatever the team looks like if and when they win a Super Bowl, um, I would imagine a lot of those players get like a special place in everyone's hearts and a lot of them get into the ring of honor, even if they were kind of only there for that moment because that moment would be so big. Like I could see that. Ha I don't really know how that would work out. I don't know. They've never won the Super Bowl. How should I know how they're going to react to that? But uh I think to get into the ring of honor, you have to be a, an integral part of like an era. You have to be really def like Joey Browner. That's the eighties Vikings. He just, he just is the eighties Vikings. He's in the ring of honor. So I think of somebody like Harrison Smith, Chad Greenway, those guys, you know, Chad Greenway defines an era of Vikings football. Harrison Smith defines an era of Vikings football. So I think that gets you in the ring of honor. Somebody like, say, Stefan Diggs had a great moment, but I don't know if he defines a full era of Vikings football. He was in the organization for five, six years. Like, the, or, yeah, it was six, right? Like, he was in the organization for six years. That's a that's a good run. But I don't know if that quite gets you in the ring of honor because that six years was only part of an era, you know, the Zimmer era of Vikings football. Um, and, and there's still, you know, these kind of tales on the end of it that he wasn't a part of, even though he had that great moment. I think like that, that like Diggs is probably the hardest one actually to parse out because that moment might just get him in. Like I could see it, but I don't know. Uh, I, I think you have to be, def you have to define an era and that is sort of a long-term thing. I guess that's what I'm getting at. But if, if the Vikings win the Super Bowl this year, all bets are off. Everybody in the whole thing gets in the ring of honor. Like it'll be a huge thing. Totally change everything. I'll see you all tomorrow. And as always, skull.